Well done, Chris, firstly. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Thank you very much. And, um, Chris, Chris is a self-taught artist. You know, pull me up if I'm saying anything wrong. Yeah, yeah that's one. And uh, <laughs> so, expressionism. Yeah, yeah, expressionism. What I'll be talking about quite a lot is just um, I work in a few different areas. So I'll be talking about technology. Yeah, technology. Yeah, Futurism. So. Certainly influenced by. And the reason, the reason I, you know, with with. I've seen, you know, Chris's work, incredible, and it, it's definitely, from your own words, um, a combination of energy that that he puts pulls into his art, and that manifests itself in feeling. So sometimes you can feel the art, you know, correctly if I'm vibrating, you can actually feel it. So it's kind of amazing stuff to see, and. Uh, we're privileged here tonight to be able to share a speaker like Chris to give us an insight into his work and what he does. And um, I think I've probably said enough for tonight, really, to, to hand you over to Chris. Big round of applause for Chris. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you to Salon Noir. I'm very, uh, feel very privileged to uh, give this talk. Um, I'll, I'll try my best with the volume. I'm not so good at public speaking, but I'll try my best. So, uh, yeah, just let me know if I'm um, a bit quiet. But uh, yeah, so my talk is called uh, The Artist Engineer A Matrix of Meaning. Um, uh, there's a bit, there's some like Twitter and website and stuff. But basically, the talk is going to be split into two main parts. So, the first part, I'm going to be talking about some theory. So uh, as part of my uh, artistic practice I have written a bit of theory, art theory, um, so I'll talk a bit about that. I have this idea of the artist engineer. It's a sort of archetype uh, which I developed uh, as an idea. And then the second part is basically me uh, just talking about my work, what influences it, uh, form of discussion, and how I've actually implemented this idea I have uh, of the artist engineer uh, into my own practice. Um, so, as always, uh, I think memes are a very effective way of uh, communicating ideas. Uh, so, I've, I've sort of, this meme on the right is just sort of me trying to basically uh, envision what, how I see the process of art throughout eternity or time, if you will. Uh, so you've got a man, an actual man, on a hill, wondering about the future. Uh, and then you've got the uh, the man on the hill portrayed by an artist. So that's the artist, this is the man on the hill. It's a bit of a weird one, but I was just trying to... Commun I think memes are a good way of communicating. Cause that, might, that might be quite a strange thing, but I don't like it. Uh, so, you know, people in the gaps are then this is in the, in the present. You have people um, in a gallery looking at a painting of a man done by the artist. And then this is sort of just a, sort of an analogy of like how um, art is a continuous process. It's continually, it's a continual um, uh, attempt to uh, portray experience, really. And that's a big part of my art. Own art. So, okay, this is just a general overview of like what I'm about, what I'm interested in. Um, so I used to be, so I've been involved in a lot of different projects, uh, studio projects, art collectives, that sort of thing. Uh, formerly, I'm from up north, uh, so formerly I was uh, a former director and studio member at a place called Electric Picture House, which is a uh, artist cooperative in Congleton, Cheshire. Does anyone know where Congleton, Cheshire is? Oh, you know where Cheshire is. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah, I'm from a small town in uh, near Manchester, and uh, that was uh, that was a good formative experience. Uh, my main uh, sort of uh, collective I'm involved in now is the Tunnel. So there's a few members of the Tunnel here tonight. We're, a bait, we're essentially a, a um, we put on shows, we're an artist collective, we, we discuss art, we develop um, books, magazines, writings, um, yeah. Uh, 
so in terms of what the mediums I work in, I work in painting, I uh, do create writing, uh, write poems, uh, I do read some digital art, 2D digital art. Also, um, I have a sort of technical side, so I have a background in, I actually studied computer science, so my background academically is computer science, so I develop games, I do a bit of music production, uh, 3D visualization, and my day job is basically web developer, so I'm a programmer essentially. Uh, more recently I've been doing augmented uh, reality development, so in a sense, sort of a jack of all trades in some ways. So, yeah, like I was saying, uh, so this first part of the talk is essentially just talking about this idea I've had, which I've written about, uh, called the artist engineer. So, the artist engineer is a paradigm of an artistic archetype for a new century that demands a change in methods of reflecting on ourselves and the productive processes and meaning of the art we produce. The artist engineer reforms and rearranges the world according to their desire generated through the prism of networks and energy flows. The artist engineer takes the tools of the present to make a better world for all, to reform and restructure the elements of the universe in a manner not unlike the alchemists of old. The true artist engineer is a free agent of creativity, utilising and developing new technologies to expand the human potential uh, for possibility and imagination, when in the corridors of the possible, intellectually, spiritually, and technologically, to create a world of symbiosis between pure art, design, and technology. Uh, so there's a lot in there. Uh, that's a broad overview of what the idea of uh, what this uh, is trying to achieve, and it, or what it's trying to uh, describe, I suppose, as a, as a tendency in art. Uh, it's in no way prescriptive. I don't want this to, I don't want it to appear like I'm saying this is the only way to do art now. I do not believe that. I just think it's a good way to describe a certain tendency of uh, amongst you know sort of contemporary artists and creators, I suppose. So it's not the way to do art. It's just I'm not I'm not drawn to that in like art theory or philosophy or anything. It's just a perception, my perception, as it were. Oh, sorry, a bit too fast there. Uh, so this is just a bit of uh, writing I did about. This current age that we live in. So, we live in an age of uh, simula simulacra and simulation. So, information networks connect the world like never before. So, we have this huge big data society, billions of lives in a constant flux and river of bits and bytes, uh, convoluting across shared network, network being primarily the internet. So, the question I sort of wanted to answer with this artist engineer idea was, well, what what part will art have in this sort of carnival of cybernetics? What place will it have in this in this brave new world that we live in? So that's that was sort of the uh, the question that prompted me to, to do this piece of writing. Okay. So quite unusually I guess I sort of looked at the uh, theory of cybernetics, which is a science of communication and control theory that is concerned especially with the comparative study of automatic control systems uh, such as the nervous system and the brain and electrical communication systems. So this is quite unusual I suppose in a way because I'm looking to a mathematical and scientific concept and seeing how we can apply that to the uh, contemporary art world I suppose. Um, now I'm no expert on cybernetics by any stretch of the imagination, I just found it a fascinating idea, especially the concept of uh, feedback loops. So um, yeah, it, I just found it a very compelling idea, I suppose. And I'll just talk a little bit more about that. Okay. Uh, again, this is just a bit more of the writing, it's an extract from the piece. Uh, so, the artists in the 21st century exist in a world of information overload uh, and emerging information society. The question should be then, how can an artist make sure that they steer their desires and will in the direction that guides whatever will emerge from the post of our post uh, ruins of our post-economic crash, post-9-11 world in a positive direction? 
So we propose that we can start by embracing constructive chaos and by becoming the cybernetic feedback loop, so this is where the idea of the feedback loop comes into it, in the flows of information that now largely dictate and guide our destinies. So it's a constant reinvention of perpetual reorganising with the collective unconscious. Uh, now how does this relate to art? Uh, we must seek to create an art that reflects this informational chaos and seeks to reorganise it. Uh, we recraft our current story into an order that makes sense and both reflects and directs the energetic flows of the incoming information society into a systematic feedback loop of imaginative energy and information. So there's a lot going on there. Uh, it's, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, I'm sort of sexing up some of the concepts with the language there, uh, but essentially it's talking about, like I said, um, learning to li live with the chaos of the moment that we're in now, because we live in a, well, a lot of people would say we live in a post-truth moment, where it's, there's no real, it doesn't feel like there's any way to uh, establish truth or you know, make truth claims anymore. So. Um, that's a sort of bigger conversation, but uh, essentially it's, it's sort of like a, I want to put it a bit sort of like a, there's a certain surrealist spirit I'm trying to infuse into this thing as well. I don't want it just to be, I know it can be a bit like, it can seem a bit weird because it's like very mechanistic, but yeah, that's that. So this is one of the like key phrases that I, I want to like make, uh, just very short, snappy, because obviously some of this stuff in here is quite, it's not like dead, dead complex, but it's going to be a lot to digest. So I made these slogans. Uh, so the artist must become the loop so that they may reassemble and create new loops in the system of reality. So again, feeding <coughs> the idea of feedback loops. Uh, and this is a piece of art I'm, I, made, I made a while ago digitally. It actually features a lot of artwork by tunnel artists. So we've got a pitch, uh, piece there by Jamie Stantonian, who's in the audience here. Uh, we've got a piece by Matt Chu there, Mark Rathmore, me, Monica Tavell. So it's like a sort of collage of, um, sort of whirlwind of flesh, really. Of different you like that? Yeah, thank you very much. Really cool. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and also Jessica Valentine, actually, all the hands. Lots of body parts. Yeah, yeah I kind of really love Body parts. I'm really, I'm really drawn to like. <laughs> without wanting to sound really weird, but like I, I'm really drawn. Drew, drew, what, my, well, we'll, you'll see a little bit later on. A lot of my early work is heavily in, is biomorphic, so it's like very much about morphing of the body. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it still is. Um, it's heavily. That's a heavy, heavy theme. So we're almost all past the sort of theory bits. So we'll be showing you more of the development of the work, but uh, biomorphism has been a big thing. Actually. So almost, uh, this is basically just, so uh, obviously if you're an engineer, then an engineer is, has the tools they can use. So this is just a quick overview of uh, potentially, if you wanted to use tools, um, sort of become this artist engineer as it were. So I talk about um, using the, I mean this is a bit weird, but the pulse of the electronic machine. So that could, um, that's a bit poetic license there maybe, but I'm basically saying sort of coding, programming, that sort of thing. Uh, emerging virtual reality tools, this is a real emergent area. Uh, I think there's a lot of more popularity in uh, contemporary art for this um, this medium. I think it's very exciting in terms of uh, storytelling and narratives. I think there's already, I mean, you could argue this game's more than uh, <coughs> art, but that's an ongoing discussion. That's just computer software. Um, so yeah, basically just like utilizing tools in an interesting way. And uh, this example here, actually, this is a digital piece I did. So there's a few different elements to it. I actually uh, saw a programmer, like this was mentioned before, so I've actually incorporated some of my own code, written it into the background, collaged the elements in, so it's a self-portrait as well on some level. And uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of been something I want to expand on and do more. It's using utilizing actual computer code or programming. Like this is FreeJS in this example, which is JavaScript um, graphics library. Um, but yeah, okay. and just another slogan from the from the, uh, the sort of not manifest of the essay thing we did. So the lights at the end of the tunnel are the lights engineers. 
So, um, does anybody know the central artwork? In, I don't know who, who the artist that did the central artwork. Because I, I, I Otto D. No, close, but George. George Cross. Kirchner. Kirchner. Kirchner yeah. <laughs> so this is um, this is a great. Um, I love this painting. It's one of my favourite self-portraits by an artist. It's, uh, yeah, it's painted by Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. Um, a sort of self-castration is how it's often been uh, described. He's after he had a nervous breakdown uh, as a soldier. Uh, I love that painting. So, yeah, this is a digital piece I did. And it's, again, a this actually utilises... Uh, so Jessica Ballantyne, who's an artist friend of mine, these green sort of things around here, it's actually sort of recontextualized, reused elements of her painting. So I like doing that a lot. And then uh, obviously this is, uh, is it Casper David Fred? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, so uh, that's that guy. I like that. I love that image actually. It's really iconic. And I use it quite a lot uh, in my work. But anyway, let's carry on. Okay. So obligatory uh, philosophical quote, trying to be deep. <laughs> um, yeah, life is not breath but action, and essentially that is the that is the crux uh, of this artist engineer like, um, theory. Basically, is just do things, try things out, like try two D art, try music, try poetry, try coding, just try and mix it all up. There's no rules to this thing, you know. Just mix it up as much as you can. Um, and this is a digital piece. I've also got I've got a T-shirt of this one here as well. Actually, this is a so, yeah, you can probably tell that I've been sort of examining and uh, recontextualizing lots of art history in my digital uh, work and sort of giving it a weird contemporary spin, I suppose. Uh, so, yeah, definitely where we're at, and then I've just uh, put a TV in that with some binary. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. So, I think that's basically... Yeah, so that's the first part of this. That's the, like, sort of art theory part. Done. So, that's, like, a sort of high-level... Uh, uh, exploration of some ideas about it. Now this is going to be a bit more personal, so this is about me. This is about my work, this is about my journey in, in artwork, and I'll basically, the format's going to be, I'm just going to show some paintings from, and drawings, very early stuff from the beginnings, and sort of just talk my journey from the personal to the ideas, the intellectual, the rest of it. So there's a little picture of me there, I was a little boy actually, as well. That's my brother trying to blow up my candles. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's go. So, like was mentioned before, I'm a self-taught artist. I basically began painting, I think, about the age of 19. So, I guess probably like a lot of self-taught artists, where I started off was uh, a garage in my parents' house. So, uh, this is me, I think, aged about maybe 20, 20 I can't remember exactly how old I was then. Uh, much younger and handsome, of course, and uh, it was 09, so yeah, whatever that adds up to. But um, yeah, so I started from garage, I started painting, I'll just talk a little bit about this. Uh, so I'm going to just show a few really, really early drawings. Uh, I stress these are early, these are actually drawings and doodles I was doing while I was at university. So like I said, um, like I was mentioned, I have no formal academic background in art. I was a doodler in university. So I was studying computer science, uh, but I would doodle. I would spend, I'd probably, you know, probably spend half the time doodling. So these are sort of early drawings that came out of that, really. So um, this is called Pride of Set. So I had a very, uh, sort of, I had a very early interest in mythology and the occult. So uh, I don't know why I was drawn to that exactly, but I just found it fascinating. I've always been drawn to Egyptian culture. Well, that was probably what I mean early on, so that probably inspired that. It's quite a strange image. It's, uh, it's supposed to be Set, who's the sort of evil uh, deity, I think, in Egyptian uh, mythology. Um, yeah, it's just a very early drawing. You've got this sort of chess, chess board going on. Probably a bit of an influence from surrealism as well, I suppose. And I also got early development of sort of doing these weird like sigil characters uh, so yeah that's that so I sort of start, started just doing these weird like drawings like that uh, also sort of these yeah crude drawings so again it's like sort of like our crumb sort of thing I guess 
uh, very weird, sort of surreal, very crude. I'm, I'm not, I'm not like suggesting this is good art or anything, but it was uh, just like an early sort of experimentation, and it's literally on line paper. So this is just like, you know, sort of not doing my computer science homework and just drawing some random stuff basically. Uh, and I was sort of drawn as well, so I was drawn to this sort of weird surrealist expressionist uh, aesthetic, but I was also um, very drawn to sort of geometry and patterns. So this is another drawing from around that period. It's uh, called Angled Mindfuck. So, yeah, not the most, uh, maybe not the best title, but uh, yeah, sort of just, um, I got sort of obsessed with triangles for a while. <laughs> and uh, portraying them, I suppose. What's that? There's another, yeah, it's another one. It's like, um, yeah, sort of started getting into like, um, I think Kandinsky was a big influence at first, something like uh, Mondrian. Uh, that's sort of the classic, um, uh, classic abstract artists of the 20th century. That's like my first exposure to art. That's how I first started experimenting. So yeah, this is a piece called Geometric Moon. So I eventually did make this to a painting. I think it now resides in Australia. But this is the initial uh, drawing. So yeah, just, you know, just sort of experimenting with sort of like uh, abstract art, sort of modernist inspired abstract art, I suppose. So yeah. Um, so yeah, so sometimes I, I did go through some hard stuff. Uh, I have bipolar one. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on that, but it is something I do have. Um, so art was a um, good way of uh, working through some stuff. Uh, this is a drawing called Torn. Obviously, you can tell the lines. It's not very professional, I know, but this is early days. Um, so I suffered with this thing called depersonalization, which is sort of a disassociation feeling. And uh, that's one of the drawings that came out of that, just trying to dis uh, visually document uh, how it made me feel, I suppose. Which is always good. Okay, no, it's very good for that. Um, and this is, this is, again, sort of, I'm not trying to get too macabre or sad, but I drew this when I was in hospital. The Kandinsky influence is probably uh, quite obvious, I suppose. You know, abstract shapes and sort of a, yeah, I'll move on anyway. Yeah, and was just the last final one for this early stuff. Uh, so I was quite influenced by expressionism. I like Picasso, but yeah, again, like my level was, my, I had very surface level knowledge at this time, and I was just sort of experimenting. Okay. So let's just look at, so I started painting. So eventually, um, I wanted to experiment with painting. At first I just experimented with oil paints, and then I sort of moved to acrylics. Um, my first paintings were sort of experiments in abstraction. Um, this is just a piece called Maelstrom, it's very small, uh, I think I sold it ages ago, I can't remember actually, but it's like just very, you know, sort of loose, abstract expressionist sort of thing. Just helped me to get used to handling paint. Uh, I, still, I still do tend to uh, shift a lot between abstraction and figuration and vice versa, but I think most painters do that on some level. But, uh, yeah, so just an early experiment with painting really. Yes, yeah, so that sort of fluid moments all, all over composition sort of thing. Uh, sort of energy was a big concern. Um, and yeah, so it's, and then, so, I mean, this is, uh, some imagery began to appear in my work with a degree of abstraction still. It's a typical thing you do when you're about 20 years old and, you know, a bit of a stoner or whatever. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that sort of came into it. But. Uh, so this is, I actually like this, so I don't like a lot of my old work, I'll just say that, I mean, I don't think, I think most painters are a bit like this, like you, you have this early stuff that you do, and you sort of feel very icky about it, this is one I actually still like a bit, so this is called Macabre Twist, uh, I still <coughs> like it, I like the composition, it's sort of got a figurative feeling, but it's abstract, so that was still quite nice, I've still got that at my parents' house actually, and I'm not, not too like, Dissatisfied with life, you know. Um, uh, this is the first painting I ever sold. It's called Solar Winds. Uh, sold to my, my grandparents for 80 quid. So, uh, this is eight, 2009 I did this. 
it's funny because my uh, sometimes uh, I've heard my granddad say to people that I'm a psychedelic painter, which always makes me chuckle a bit. I think it's quite funny. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's, I think that's still at my grandparents' house, probably actually, from a walk somewhere. Sort of, uh, I guess you can see a sort of mirror influence there, maybe. Uh, slightly different colours, but yeah, sort of like early emergence of biomorphism, um, sort of these like, almost like sun shapes and lots of suggestive shapes that aren't quite anything but could be something basically. Okay, so like I said, this is just like literally a linear journey. Uh, so one of the, the next big like evolution in my sort of journey, as it were. Uh, I got involved in a community, so where I'm from in Congleton, there is uh, studios called Victoria Mill. It's literally an old uh, Victoria, um, old Victoria Mill. So before that, I was like literally a sort of skater dude who just knew other skateboarders, and uh, I didn't know anyone who was really into art. None of my mates were into art. Uh, I was just sort of, you know, doing that thing, and no one else I knew really knew it. So it was really good to get into Victoria Mill and sort of, yeah, just discover community, which is of course very important and integral and key, I think, to, you know, expanding your awareness and all that sort of thing. Oh, I've gone too far there. Uh, yeah, okay, so that was my studio. Some early stuff there, hardly any of which exists anymore. Just a little JPEG of it. Uh, Again, some more early work, uh, sort of gives you an idea of the sort of scale I was working at. Uh, again, not like 100% happy with these works, but they're all right, they sort of exist. Um, and it was great being at Victoria Mill because I got to my first exposure to other people who are painters. So I got to learn a lot more, a lot faster by being around peers. That's one of the really important things, I think, of, of developing any sort of art practice is uh, being around peers who can not only challenge you but also uh, sort of feed you tips for the work, I guess. So that was that. my first solo show, just you know, like a small uh, town in northwest of England. That's actually my mum there, my grandmother actually. My mate Mick, who's a, a great artist in his own right, he's a graffiti artist, it's the back of my granddad's head. Um, and yeah, it's sort of uh, you can sort of see bits of the work here. It's it's becoming a little better, I think, but it's sort of still early days, I guess. Uh, so, also at the around about this time, started experimenting with digital art. So, uh, this is early stuff, but like I used the uh, the worst name for a graphics program ever, GIMP, <laughs> uh, which is literally the the worst ever name for a graphics program. It stands for GNU Image Manipulation Program, but yeah, GIMP sounds like that. What do you work with? GIMP. Sounds a bit weird. Um, so yeah, it's basically Photoshop, essentially, just free. Uh, started messing around with that. This is a photograph that's been digitally altered uh, of my friend from my hometown, Amanda. We used to just go out and take art pictures of each other and stuff. That's like a really early uh, digital piece. Um, Typical, typical thing of like being 20 and thinking smoking is really cool and stuff. Right? <laughs> um, so yeah, I've started to sort of very early days. This is like experiment with sort of using glitch-like effects. So I've developed that a lot more now, but sort of the early days of that, that is, I guess. And yeah, collage started to become a bit more of a thing. This is a, a early sort of self-portrait of like. I don't know, uh, picture art, sorry, and sort of just used that as a starting ground and yeah, created a poster, like sort of faux uh, Soviet avant garde poster. Uh, so, yeah, the next place to move to is Electric Picture Arts Co op. This is a workers' own co op. So, um, again, in Congleton, we basically moved to another building. But we built from, moved from Victoria Mill, a bunch of us moved to, a, to this place beautiful old cinema building. It's a, it was a workers' co-op, so it's managed by the people who actually own it. Um, sort of art, art socialism in action, I guess, maybe, or something like that. So it's literally owned by the, work, the people who, and, I don't know, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, so it's a very historical building. There used to be a cinema, an ambulance station. 
Uh, it's still running actually today, so it's been running actually in total now for about maybe eight years. And uh, but on different premises, but yeah, it's still running. So this is this is what it looked like inside. So it was a proper like. Uh, and, you know, we've got to you got to bear in mind I'm from a small town in the north of England. This was like paradise for me. Uh, apart from the heating, which was terrible, it was always cold. But that's pretty much most large studios. Uh, and yeah, you know, there's the gallery and everything. It's quite, quite a lovely place, actually. Uh, so it's just like a little overview of some of the artwork I made while I was there. Uh, so I was pretty prolific while I was here. Uh, this is a show I had on there. Um, not the best arranged show, I would have arranged it differently now, but it was quite a uh, manic panic before we actually put all the stuff up. I actually had a friend help me out a little bit. Um, uh, but yeah, that, that was that was good, that was fun. It was nice to see all my work together in one place as well at the time. Um, so I think my style began to mature a bit. Um, I began to use texture a bit more. Um, it began to be a bit more of a mix of abstraction and figuration instead of being one or the other. So this is a painting called Chomp, which I think is now somewhere in London. Uh, I think I gave it to one of my ex housemates And... Um, yeah, it just became a bit more, um, I think, better in a way. Like I started to um, take on board more influences from more contemporary art, uh, artists, like maybe, you know, well, more or less contemporary, like Basquiat or something like that. I started to get into that sort of uh, painting. But I was also trying, I was trying to consciously not ape it too much, I guess, not not just copy it, but. You know, you condense all these influences and try and do some with them, I suppose. Uh, this is an early big one, it's called Manic Minor. Um, it's 180 by 120, I think, roughly, cent uh, centimeters. And it's one of the first big paintings I did. Um, sort of, I guess, influenced by something like Edward Launch, in a slightly different style as well, slightly more exaggerated colors. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, mean, I was basically starting to move towards this more painterly style, I suppose. Whereas before everything was quite flat, it was starting to become a bit more gestural. This is an abstract painting I did, which is quite large, glacial unrest. So yeah, the sort of painterliness scratching in and being a bit more aggressive with the paint started to come into a bit more. Um, I think that painting destro is destroyed now, unfortunately, but um, yeah, that was. That was one of the early ones after that period. And then I had a big, big move. I went off to the big smoke. So I left the, left the city. I left the, the town I was living in. And uh, yeah, came down to London and uh, obviously kept my studio really clean. Um, so got a job here and just um, moved on to my dad's boat at the time for a while. Uh, I got a studio in Woolwich with second floor studios who are a really good um, studio provider actually, they're very good to me. And yeah, that was my space for a while, so that was great. Um, let's move on a bit. Uh, so I got involved with the Viner Street scene by uh, Cultivate initially. And that's where I met uh, Matt Tudor, uh, Jessica, Jessica Valentine, and an uh, artist called Matt Randall as well, amongst other people. And uh, we basically formed the tunnel, which would, uh, was an art collective primarily based around ideas and putting on shows. Uh, the foundation of it is ideas, really, I think. Should do shows based on uh, uh, books, ideas, philosophies. It's an interesting group. Uh, I love being a part of it, and uh, it's, it's great. Uh, so, this is a painting called Twinned. This is quite big, it's 150 by 120, I think. Um, so, yeah, again, it's more it's more sort of like semi-abstract than just abstract or just figuration. And I, uh, uh, I, I had a really good time actually. It was very prolific at this time. It's probably the most prolific of being as painter. And uh, scale become I scaled everything up. I guess that's often what painters will do when they when they want to just get really a bit more ambitious with it is scale stuff up. Uh, it can become a problem later on, but. Sort of, it's really fun to do. I, I really enjoyed it. It's scaling up. Uh, it's a painting called Miss Lucifer. Sort of, it's very abstract, but uh, 
sort of very loosely figurative as well. I don't know if you can see the sort of suggestion of things like eyes and boobies. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's that's that. So it looks a bit more like splattering as well. What paint do you use? Uh, generally speaking, acrylic. I try and get like uh, use yeah, nearly always acrylic. So I started off using uh, oil paints. Uh, but I was well, this is very early on when I was just experimenting. Uh, but because I, I sort of like working quite fast, so acrylic obviously helps with that. I like um, just having things I can react to very fast and know it'll be dry within like, you know, half an hour or whatever. Uh, I should explore oils more though, actually, but uh, I would like to actually at some point in the future. But uh, generally speaking, I'm working acrylics when it comes to painting. Uh, this is a painting called Man is the Monkey. Uh, I guess there's probably an obvious Basquiat influence there. We have this sort of teeth and everything. Um, I'm fine with that. I love Basquiat. I think he was a great painter. And uh, I was sort of like trying to take some um, of his iconography, I guess, and then just sort of do something different with it as much as I could do, and also develop my own sort of uh, symbolic language to I suppose. So that was going on, I guess, at that time. I did a mural um, at Second Floor Studios Cafe. Uh, so this is a pretty big thing to do. Um, I did a, I, did, I worked from a sketch, but sort of uh, the colours were mostly freestyled. That was an interesting experience. It's called hyperdimensional headaches, and uh, yeah, it is. A, I really enjoyed uh, being given the opportunity to do a mule, and um, I think it turned out all right. I don't think it exists anymore actually, because I think Second Floor Studios moved. Um, yeah, that one. How are we doing for time, by the way? Is it all right? Is it broken? Yeah, cool. That's a picture of me by my mule. Uh, a bit blurry, but. Um, <coughs> So it gives you an idea of scale, I suppose. Um, yeah. uh, I had my first solo show in at the No Format Gallery. Uh, again, this will give you a little bit of the idea of the scale of the painting. So that's Man is the Monkey on the right, and uh, I can't remember what that called. Feed Me or something that painting was called. Um, so it sort of gives you some idea of sort of um, the work from around that period. Reading like a maniac. That's my incredibly That's clean cool. desk. Um, so yeah, I, I, I uh, yeah, I wasn't the most tidy painter. Really. I guess the most most of us aren't really. But yeah, uh, yeah, that was that's that. That's my gunky table. Just before I moved up. Um, this is a part of a well, it's a work in progress actually. This painting, but I did a, a painting called Information War. Uh, which is the biggest painting I've ever done, I think it was two by two meters. And technology started to become much more of a, uh, a sort of visual landscape I wanted to explore in my paintings. I, don't, I mean, it's painting, so I, I don't know exactly what it means or what it, what it is about, but I know that there's a lot of um, concepts going around my head around uh, technology and how that is affecting us as individuals. So information war, it's sort of my way of uh, visualising that really. And that's my friend Becca, she just visited the studio that day. So she's there, she's also a painter actually. Uh, so yeah, I went, uh, after being in London I went back up north for a bit. Uh, I had a studio in Manchester for a while. I started doing more portraits actually. Uh, just work in progress sort of expressionist portrait. So I sort of started to return to the body a bit more and uh, the uh, yeah, figurative uh, imagery on some level. I got ready to do life drawing, so my <coughs> friend uh, Scott got me back into doing life drawing. Uh, I'd done a bit before, but um, I started to really enjoy doing that because it's a very good way to learn, it's a very good way to improve the draftsman, you know, your skills as a, as a drawer and then probably as a painter as well. And, in some way. Uh, so these are a few of my life drawings from around that time. Obviously, uh, if any of you have ever been to a life drawing session, you know you usually have like a, sometimes a five minute window, 10 minute, like half an hour maybe. So that was really good because it sort of 
uh, means you have to make decisions, you have to make marks, and you have to live with those decisions, which is good. So I started, yeah, basically I started uh, being drawn to the, the body again, and, and that was becoming more of a thing. Quite brutal in a way, but I sort of like that. I mean, I like that in drawing and painting in general. So. Um, again, another one just there. Uh, I think this is from a life drawing session that Becca did, actually, Stranger Than Life Drawing. This is a maximum. Let's see so, so pens. Um, uh, so this was quite an intense period of self-reflection. Uh, my time in Manchester was quite up and down, definitely up and down, actually. Um, so I'm looking not too happy there, but not exactly sad, sort of like pensive. Um, so yeah, I sort of started drawing these self-portraits in a, uh, I guess like a wiry expressionistic style. Um, another one, uh, massive hair. I did have used to have a lot bigger hair. Just another selfie. Um, Isolation and alienation became a big theme. Um, I started to sort of develop a sort of social conscious. Um, in Manchester, there's a lot of homelessness, and that really started to mentally affect me a bit, I think. And I was also in quite a lot of poverty myself, so not, nothing too extreme, but I was, very, um, I was struggling at points. Um, so I think that started to emerge in my artwork a lot more, I think. Uh, this drawing is. You know, I mean, the way I perceived this drawing was that it was a sort of alienated office worker or something, staying, I mean, maybe we can all identify with that on some level. Staying late after work, staring into this blank rectangle, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I got really into drawing the streets. So uh, I would often spend, I was unemployed for a long time during this period. And I just like to walk around the city and draw, basically, the city scenes, and just sketch. Always a very good uh, exercise, of course. Um, so yeah, I just started sketching the city more, and uh, yeah, I just started doing that. Yeah. And it's a bit of a weird part of my life, actually. I was very, I was very like, wandering, sort of lost lad, I mean, I was like, I don't know what, I was 26, and I'd just wander around. Yeah, I'd just wander around, sometimes like, Sometimes I wander around late at night, I've suffered from insomnia a bit, and just literally just talk to random homeless people. So that's that, like I was saying before, that sort of was a thing that I started drawing me out. This is a sort of drawing from imagination of a, of a homeless person. Um, that came into my approach a lot more as well, actually. I started writing a lot more about just, uh, um, yeah, just the sort of dark side of any scene. The struggle of it, I guess. Self-portraits took on a bit of a dark angle, actually. So uh, I started to, I had started developing this whole thing of uh, portraying myself as a sort of doomed World War One soldier, which is a bit weird. Um, so yeah, I was feeling a bit doomed, uh, a bit nihilistic, maybe. I think everyone sort of, a lot of people probably go through this phase in their life where you sort of feel a bit directionless. Uh, so we sort of explored that in my artwork, I suppose. Um, so I've got a few drawings on this sort of theme that I've picked out. Uh, yeah, but also I would often portray myself as a sort of, um, yeah, like I said, doomed soldier in this sort of desolate environment. Um, and it was just like a sort of uh, unconscious thing I was working through, I think, in a lot of ways. I just wanted to sort of think of, um, well the next painting probably illustrates it quite well, so uh, this is a, a painting called uh, The Dark Inside Me, so I just wanted to think, um, I wanted to portray myself as um, the, the shadow side of me, I guess you put it in young in terms or whatever. Um, so this is me, a little soldier image again, uh, maybe in some sort of desolate environment, there's a hand sort of moving towards me. We don't know if it's peaceful, we don't know if it's um, attacking. There's uh, some sort of dead or injured person in the background. Um, 
And yeah, I've never shown this painting publicly. It's still, it's on my parents' though, isn't it? Uh, I might even work on it again. I'm not sure, but um, that was like it was meter by meter, so it was one of the bigger ones I worked on while I was in Manchester. And uh, yeah, that was that was a big phase of stuff I was doing. Um, yeah, this is just like I did a lot of these weird little drawings. So yeah, consolidating influences from Basque. Yeah. I uh, read Deleuze and Guattari and all that sort of postmodern stuff, um, uh, which I found really hard to understand. Uh, still do struggle with a lot of it, but there was some interesting uh, bits of uh, information to draw on, I suppose. Uh, and the expressionists became more of an influence, got more into like um, Sludgwick Kirchner and yeah, I'll take Dick's like so much before. Uh, uh, Sorry, I'm, I don't mean to take this into really macabre mode, but like this is this is also I'm just saying this is how it went. So I really, things got really bad when I was in Sheffield. So I, I moved to Sheffield, and Sheffield's lovely, but uh, uh, this is Solomon in the shadow of the Black Star. So I moved to Sheffield. I moved back, I moved back to my parents for a bit, uh, but things didn't go well. Uh, I moved to Sheffield with my mate, uh, and this was a really bad phase in my life. But I think it's probably worth looking at the artwork from it, I guess. Uh, so this is Solomon in the Shadow of the Black Star, self-portrait of sorts. You've got this sort of, of this sort of a fixation of death going on there, of course. Um, sort of screaming baby head thing. Uh, so it's sort of started taking on sort of macabre surrealism, I suppose. Um, so that's what I was going through. So I just, I think you have to express what you're going through at the time, and that's what I was going through at that time. Uh, so again, a bit domesticated and weird and haunting. This is a picture of the cat I lived with, but uh, it looks a bit sort of haunting maybe and a bit weird. I was very, I was, I mean, I'm introverted in general, but that became even more of a thing, I guess. So it's sort of like, yeah, weird. And uh, that's just a drawing from a flat or something. So it's, yeah. Um, yeah, the dream world sort of became a metaphor for these struggles I was having with. Uh, Nihilistic, nihilism, not feeling any purpose. Uh, this is a piece called Machine Boy and Balloon Girl, another self portrait. I'm sort of carrying a mask there. Um, there's this sort of weird woman with a strange head and a balloon, and uh, a little beer bottle in the background. So I did a lot of these drawings that just, um, just to express how I felt this profound sense of, uh, I guess, lethargy and melancholy, maybe. Which is, is you know, it's probably as a result of my illness getting a bit worse, which can happen, but, um, yeah. This is a really weird drawing. I'm not really, I don't know what to think of this still, even when I look at it. It's called Where Are My Glasses? So, yeah, everything became very macabre. Uh, I was in a really bad spiral of uh, depression, unemployment, smoking weed, uh, typical sort of thing. Um, and yeah, I just sort of create this bizarre menagerie of uh, characters, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But things did get better. So um, I met a woman. I met uh, Yulia, who's my uh, was my girlfriend. Uh, she's Russian. It's really helped me drag me out of my depression. So. Um, we sort of started off as pen pals and then we, uh, um, we met in real life and that was good and things went well. Um, I was working at Dean of the Arts Centre which is a great art centre in Sheffield, you, got, you should visit if you ever get a chance. And again, sort of the, another theme of what sort of journey thing was uh, being around people who are creative helped me get on with my life and just gave me out the self imposed exile so that really helped. So this is sort of like almost the final part, we've got five minutes left. This is just a, this is a, draw, a painting I did in collaboration with Yulia. Um, so we did this little, not exactly finished, but um, transition was called. Which was sort of almost like telling the future in a way because uh, I moved to Russia. So, uh, which is a sort of transition really, from Russia to London to Russia, or Sheffield to uh, Russia. Which bit of Russia? Moscow. So uh, I was living in Moscow for almost two years. Um, During lockdown. 
Da da da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, more than say da da. But uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, yeah. During the lockdown, yeah, so that was a bit odd. Uh, this is a really amazing fabric. They got all these amazing Soviet. I mean, not you know, like regardless of any ideological whatever, the, the Soviet stuff is amazing to me. So uh, change your style of painting for a moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would have been happy to have done that actually. I love it. I mean, I, I genuinely like. I mean, regardless of what you think about the Soviet Union, there's something really stunning about that piece. Um, it's very striking. Anyway. Uh, yeah. So it's an amazing fabric piece. I just love the Moscow. It's just so it's an opportunity, of course, for Instagram. So yeah, I moved to Moscow and. Uh, yeah, to be with my girlfriend basically. Um, and this is mostly drawing of this during this period. I know I've only got a few minutes left, so I'll just rush through these. Um, so I was working through my job, sort of started exploring um, consumerism, I suppose, uh, consuming a whole of mirrors. I did more digital work. This is a piece called Excessive Computation. Uh, again, technological alienation was a bit of a theme in these. Uh, very informed by the pandemic, I think. I mean, that's probably an image that could only really come from being indoors for a long time. I think, you know, sort of uh, suicidal at a computer. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I, I was consciously borrowing and recontextualizing elements from art history. So this is a uh, using uh, text from Van Gogh's one of Van Gogh's letters and also uh, imagery from uh, Sorrow, one of his great drawings. So yeah, I've sort of mentioned this before, but I started using programming, actual program, actual code, and putting it some my artworks. Okay. Uh, so there's still a sort of macabre theme, but I was sort of making it a bit more clean, concise maybe, so sort of working through that um, imagery from before and just making it maybe change, mix it up a bit. Uh, I've only got a few more minutes to go. So I'm mixing media more. Uh, this, this is a digital manipulation of a drawing, so it's like doing that a bit more. This is all quite recent, actually. Um, uh, yeah, this is a. So I, I wrote a book while I was in Moscow. I've got a few copies of it here. Uh, so I made a short stories compilation called uh, collection called Suicide by Computation. It's nine stories. Uh, if you want a copy, just ask me. I've got four copies of me. If you've got five, I'll give you it. So there's that. Uh, so did this piece got that. I know we've only got a few minutes left, so I just have to rush through. Sorry. Uh, this is just a few drawings I've done uh, from last year, sort of just showing uh, what I'm just sort of messing with at the minute. And da, 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 da. scroll on, scroll on. Um, oh, sorry. This does one more spider scroll too far. That will be the end. <laughs> ah, okay. Look at that. So, uh, life is a major of just meaning, and art is the gateway to that meaning. That's the general message but I think of my sort of uh, journey as I've been producing art, making art is uh, uh, you know ultimately like I said I struggle with nihilism and all that sort of crap uh, which is ultimately a dead end uh, and, uh, you know you have to find meaning of life and how do you find that? Making stuff really so that's how I find it anyway so uh, yeah that's the end of my talk um, there's two books I've done, so you can look them up. They're both on Amazon if you want to find them, if you want to find out more. Uh, Pandora is a collection of writings and a bit of uh, poetry and stuff. And this is the newest one, Suicide by Computation, of which there's a few copies there. And uh, that's basically it, so thanks. Thank you. Could we have the lights, please, for a moment? Yes. Yeah. Could, um, could we get the lights turned um, slightly up? That's possible. Oh, please. Oh, that's all. Oh, they've gone the other way. I suppose it's a very old premise, it's 1860, so it might be noted. But uh, that was fantastic, Chris. Thank, thank you so much for, for doing that. Now, uh, if, it, if it's okay, we've got about 15 minutes of uh, question and answers, so. Uh, yeah, fire, away. Away. fire away! Fire away! I'll try my best. Yeah. Yeah. Can you use 
you seem to use other people's bits of art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you incorporate that. Is it because you have a close connection to those people? Or do you have to get their permission or just need to use their art? Interesting or? question. Uh, I'm just wondering. No, 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 that's a very interesting <laughs> question. It's a good question, actually. Because so, it's IPR, isn't it, intellectual property? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it can be a bit of a. Definitely. So, uh, I guess obviously, when it, if you're dealing with an artist who's been dead for, I think, a few hundred years, obviously mm. that's out. It's, you know, it's not within it's sort of public realm, isn't it? Uh, but yeah, that's a funny one, actually. I guess, I guess technically, uh, I should ask explicit permission before uh, using somebody's work. Usually I do. I mean, be, usually when I uh, incorporate images from someone else's work, hmm. uh, they will sort of be give me permission on some level. I wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't want to just uh, take someone else's work and just um, you know, literally just do something on a, a digital program and say it's my own. Um, I mean, the, yeah, and the, the artists who, whose work I usually do uh, collage, um, usually very close friends of mine. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would never just download an image off Instagram from someone I don't know. Do you attribute it to them in your piece of art if you see them? Yeah, um, not explicitly. Um, perhaps I should actually. No, 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 it's Sorry, I'm asking you all these weird things. No, no, it's fine. Um, yeah. uh, I mean, obviously, I've, I've, I've sort of got mixed feelings about it. I know the copyright is a very... Uh, it's a useful system, but it's a very flawed system as well. Oh, it's very flawed. It's very um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the idea I sort of like, I don't know if everyone, anyone knows this um, uh, Creative Commons license. I quite like mm -hmm. that idea that you can um, you can set the, uh, you know, how, how you want it to be shared or, or, or otherwise. I quite like mm -hmm. that idea, um, the reuse of it. Um, it's definitely a very uh, contemporary topic because, you know, um, everyone can download anything from the internet these days. Absolutely. So, especially, I mean, it's interesting that I, I still don't know how I think about this. NFTs are sort of uh, interesting. I don't know. I don't know how to feel about them yet. Um, but that's certainly a sort of way that people think that uh, you can sort of uh, generate value for digital artworks. I still got mixed feelings on it. I'm still sort of forming opinions on NFTs. Uh, I have a friend actually who's constantly bugging me at the minute to get my stuff out as NFTs, um, which I'm still thinking about. But, you know, but yeah, uh, yeah. The, I mean, the question of ownership in general is a really uh, yeah. Uh, you spoke a lot about nihilism. Uh, you also yeah, yeah. mentioned uh, Jung. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that Jung talks about in terms of alchemizing the self, of course, is yeah. going through the four stages of. Uh, well, of alchemization, of which the first one is nihilism and nigrado, yeah, yeah. which is the overturning of all values, which goes back to Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, uh, I see that you found a relationship <coughs> and yeah, that, that your good. art <laughs> changed as a result. Yeah. Where do you think you are in that relation to the rebido and the transcendence? That's a very interesting question. Um, so yeah, I, w uh, I was... so. Basically, the relationship I was in was uh, the major relationship in my life. I won't, obviously, I won't go into everything about it, um, but you know, I was very in love with this woman, um, and I was in a really weird place and not a great place when I met her. And she did bring some structure into my life. Uh, so I definitely think. I mean, there's many different angles you could explore that from. Uh, I guess. I mean, uh, obviously, I think having any. Uh, if you're if you're sort of struggling with the whole nihilistic purposelessness, uh, then having somebody who can, uh, I guess, provide some structure and some and some love really. I mean, that's it's as simple as that. Like some care and some, um, so yeah. Are you looking to move more into the augmented reality? I'm actually working as uh, element in augmented reality. Um, so currently, uh, yeah, I am. So basically, uh, I've been doing, I mean, I can sort of nerd out on it if you want a bit. So I've been working uh, for the last uh, few years as a hobby. I've been working with A-Frame, FreeJS. These are all sort of like libraries and frameworks for creating uh, uh, 3D and VR content in the browser. 
Um, most recently, I'm just working for a company uh, on a. I can't go into too much detail, but I'm working on an application that is basically AR. Uh, and it's sort of the direction, I guess, my uh, sort of tech and career side of, my, of uh, me is going. Uh, I've, I have developed a few um, art specific um, 3D experiences. I did one for the tunnel a long time ago, which was like a uh, sort of virtual art gallery uh, using. Play Canvas, which is a um, uh, free WebGL engine, and um, I enjoyed doing that. That's a long time ago did that, but uh, it's something I want to explore more. Like the sort of um, potential of utilizing new technology, which is just getting better and more accessible all the time, and creating these sort of immersive and interesting experiences. And I think it's a real, um, it's a real new frontier. I mean, we're still very <coughs> experimental, and it's. It's exciting for that reason. Yeah. It's, I'm excited by novelty, so I'm sort of excited by that. Because yeah, most of your work is in <coughs> two dimensions. So yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you feel that you're going to be able to transfer that into? Yeah, that's a good. Uh, that's a good point. I, I I do know a little bit about 3D modeling, but I'm no expert by any stretch of the imagination. So, um, I think probably if I wanted to, uh, I mean, at the minute, like in my work, I'm working in collaboration with 3D artists, and I do the coding bit. Um, but I, I always like to learn new things, so I don't know, maybe, I mean, it's very hard 3D modeling, to be honest, but... Um, I need to get into that um, VR painting stuff. Yeah, tilt brush and all tilt that Tilt brush, stuff. that's the one. Yeah, so, that. yeah, yeah that. I have a good friend, uh, North, great artist actually, Jackie Clark, who does uh, tilt brush stuff. She does even animations, all sorts of things. Uh, that's a very interesting, I don't know if all of you are familiar with that, uh, Tilt Brush is uh, essentially painting in VR, so um, a lot of artists doing work on space which is very interesting and sort of paradigm shifting I suppose in a way, <coughs> but uh, yeah, um, yeah. With, with your the alchemy side, yeah. the psychology of your art, you mentioned the cult. In the yeah. earlier part, yeah. your interest in the, in the occult. Um, people through the ages, from Crowley right through to, to some of the chaos magicians like yeah. Ian Reid and um, Peter Carroll, yeah. like that, those fractions from the occult in, in, their, uh, in their art, alchemy. Yeah. Also, the use of hallucinogenics yeah. um, to produce <coughs> a certain type of psychology in their art. Have you gone down that road? Yeah. <laughs> and a little. And not, effect, nothing you know, to. You know, I'm not like Hunter S. Thompson, but uh, <laughs> I've certainly dabbled. Uh, I don't want to incriminate myself too much. But I think it's. No, I think it's. I think it's very. Uh, um, I mean, with all those things, uh, you have to. Uh, you have to dabble a bit to sort of know what your limits are. I guess. Uh, I won't advocate. For everyone to do it or like try it. And I'm, I'm not like I'm not like I said I'm no Hunter S. Thompson, but I've uh, <coughs> I've, I've sort of dabbled, you know, like smoke weed or whatever, salvia a few times, and some other. Um, no, I mean brought brought the philosophy of them. The yeah, then yeah. people brought it into their work. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's yeah. slightly different than just using the hallucinogenic for the sake of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's yeah, it's the sort of like. Um, so I read the. Uh, a very well-known book, Aldous Huxley's Doors of Perception, which talks about his experiences on mescaline, I believe, and how he sort of uh, wrote about how, you know, he sort of intellectualised it, I suppose, in a sense. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, the... I think he did uh, quite a lot of experimentation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he was tripping when he done it, so... Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it can be... A, it can be one door into you know interesting uh, interesting areas definitely. Um, yeah, thank you. That's a good question. So I like that question. Um, anyone else got any? Did you sell like body parts picture? Uh, the circular one. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a digital piece. So I think I still got the image somewhere. Okay. Um, so well, I mean, if you if you'd be interested in the print or something, then of course just. Uh, I can give you my email, I suppose, and just mm -hmm. get in touch. Um, I think I'll still got it somewhere. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. So you don't live in Russia anymore? 
No, uh, I moved back on the 23rd, so I've been back August 23rd, so I've been back for oh, right, really only a few recently. months actually. So quite recently. Two months. Yeah. That must have been a great experience. Really it's very interesting. I also um, was an English teacher for a while at camp. So mm -hmm. I'm not like a proper English teacher, but I helped out with this camp teaching every single day. We do like interactive fiction, poetry, haikus. That was very interesting and really cool. Um, yeah, it was really weird being in uh, Russia during COVID. That was quite a strange experience for sure. Uh, uh, more risky you need to have a short. My Russian's not that good. You didn't go swimming in the ice, did you? No. They, they cut holes in the ice. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed that so much. But um, this, the winter was quite harsh, I think, this last year. So that was. I quite like that snow, in a way. I, like, I quite like the snow, so it's alright. Did you have a Sputnik jab when you got there, or were you jabbed before you left? No, I got jabbed when I got back here. So um, actually, that was a bit annoying. So. Uh, basically, I think I could have only got the Sputnik light, which is like a lighter form of Sputnik, uh, the main one. And I would have only got, I would have only, I would have, yeah, I would have only been able to get one. So I would have, and it wouldn't even count in the UK. So I came back. I, I'm actually waiting for my second jab on the first of November. I've had my first one, so I've got a little bit of protection. Um, but yeah, that was that was um, not really going to be possible to get vaccinated over there. Uh, yeah, but it, yeah, it's a very interesting place, Russia. The culture is uh, fascinating, very different in some ways. Uh, obviously, great literary tradition, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, my Russian's not great, but I know a bit. Moscow is quite different to the rest of Russia, though. Like, like yeah, yeah, yeah. To the rest of much UK, more, you know. much more European. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a big city. It's a world in itself. It's, it's, it's all modern and they've got Starbucks and whatever. Yeah. Or if you want to go to Novi Sibersk, then that's a bit like different. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's like uh, Moscow yeah, has the McDonald's, all that thing. Yeah. It's just like here, really. Pretty much, yeah. apart from we've got. Metro is cheap and nicer. The Metro is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I love the Metro. <laughs> I, love, I agree with that, actually. I really, I really love the Moscow Metro. You've got these ornate sort of. Uh, Mules and everything, and yeah, it's really Women interesting. Women selling cabbages, apparently. So you say, yeah? Women are selling cabbages. Well, well often, yeah, you get like yeah. babushkas uh, selling things in the streets. Which is, yeah, that's what I suppose. Okay, all right. Uh, Thanks, Bruce. Thank you. Big round Thank of applause. You, everyone. We have the lights up a bit now. Is it possible? I have to work about it. Oh, it's okay. All right, I'll say what I have to say without. Um, we all we all go down the the French house, which is um, as you turn out of here, left. It's about 50 meters down on the right hand side, a uh, pub, and it's got a large outside area as well as an inside area, and uh, we can all have a have a chat with with each other, do a bit of networking, and. Uh, talk a little bit more to, to Chris, but so uh, once more, welcome on board. Yeah, cheers.